24C Divers. It is Thursday, March 11th, 2021. And we are on our Facebook Live. Everybody say hi, Kelly. <laughs> All right. If you're listening in, please, please let us know where you're listening in from. Are you here in Florida? Are you outside of Florida? Are you outside of the country? We want to know who's listening in. Say hello to us. Write it in the comments section. Also, you can give us a thumbs up, a smiley face, or a little heart and let us know that you're enjoying the presentation tonight. All right, so everybody, um, we've got our guest presenter here, and we're going to talk about what she's going to be presenting tonight. But first, just to let you guys rem uh, have a little reminder that it is Sea Turtle Month at 4C. That's right, everybody. It is the first um, nesting, uh, sorry, it's the March 1st is the nesting season start. And uh, we like to celebrate sea turtles because at 4C, we uh, love diving with sea turtles, so we want to learn more about them and learn about how we can help them. And we have lots of great presentations that we put together, and also there's items that you can uh, look through and buy that help save uh, sea turtles. So make sure you go to our website, www.force-e.com, and we uh, have a whole page devoted to sea turtles for the month. So I'll put that in the uh, in the comment section for you guys, that link. Also, if you have not um, had a chance to register for tonight, you're going to want to register. And why is that? Well, guys, if you go to our www.force-e.com, go to the event page, go to the link um, for tonight's event, click on it, that goes to our Eventbrite, and if you register on there, we're going to put you in a live drawing at the end of the night, and you could be a winner where we're going to let you get a sea turtle ecology kit, an SSI sea turtle ecology kit. That is um, actually a certification that you can obtain um, whether um, you're a diver or non-diver. So it's a great class that gives you a bunch of information about all types of sea turtles. And if you wanna take that, we are raffling off tonight. So make sure you register before 645. That's when the registration closes. All right, so everyone's coming in to say hello to you, Kelly. We got people from mm -hmm. Jupiter, from Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Coral Springs, all the way in from Hawaii. Wow, that's awesome. All right, so everybody, this is Kelly Martin. Kelly is gonna tell you a little bit about herself and the organization she works with, but we are gonna be talking about leatherback sea turtles. So Kelly, take it over. Perfect, thanks so much, Nicole, I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, my name, as she said, is Kelly Martin. Um, I am the president of Florida Leatherbacks, Inc. So tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about leatherback turtles, kind of some basic biology, and then some of the fun stuff that we've been doing in the research that we've been conducting for the last 20 years. So bear with me as I share this screen real quick. Of course, this worked when we were talking before, so let's make sure it works now. So I hope that works for everybody. Um, from my end, all I can see is my PowerPoint. So essentially, I'm just talking to myself right now. Um, but I do hope that you're able to see everything that I have to share on the screen. Um, I have been working with sea turtles for almost 20 years here in Florida. I have worked at rehab facilities. I have worked on some nesting beaches throughout the state. And for the last about 17 years, I have been working with leatherback turtles um, in Palm Beach and Martin County. So I'm really excited to share some of the fun stuff that we've been able to find through our research. So a lot of you are familiar with leatherback turtles, especially if you're in the dive community. Um, they're just some basic information. They're one of the coolest animals out there. They are the largest of the seven species of sea turtle on earth. They can get longer than seven feet in length and upwards of 2,000 pounds. They're the only living member of their family. The other six species are the hard shell turtles. Um, the Chelonids, and they've been around for over 100 million years now, and they do have the widest distribution of any reptile. They can be found in temperature tropical waters from as far north as Canada all the way down to the southern coast of South America. So these are really unique. As I mentioned, they're the only living member of their family. They don't have a hard shell like the rest of the species of sea turtle. They actually have a very rubbery um, soft shell. It almost feels like the side of the tire. 
um, just a connective tissue over loosely interlocking dermal bones. So they don't have big, thick bones like you see in some of those other turtle shells. They're just tiny little ossicles. That actually allows it to contract under pressure. These are some of the deepest diving animals in the world. And the deepest dive on record, I believe, is a little over 4,000 feet. They also have ridges, whereas the rest of our sea turtles are kind of flat. They have these seven longitudinal ridges along the top of their shell, and that actually just helps them with hydrodynamics. It helps them move through the water well. They also have a pink spot. For those that have been lucky enough to see one in the wild, um, that a lot of people think it's an injury. It's this bright red or pink spot on the top of their head. It's actually not an injury. They all have one, and it is unique to each individual. It's almost like a fingerprint. And recent research has shown that what that is is likely a window to their brain or more specifically the pineal gland. And it's allowing them to sense changes in length of day, so day and, uh, day and night. And that's probably helping them with migratory cues. So they're also really neat and they have some adaptations for tolerating cold temperatures. As I mentioned, these guys are often found off the coast of Canada foraging for their um, prey. They have what's called Countercurrent heat exchange is just a fancy name for how their blood vessels are aligned to prevent heat loss in their limbs and kind of keep it contained to the center of their body around the important organs. They also have a thick layer of fat and a network of blood vessels that allows blood to flow to the skin that will cool them when they're in warm temperatures, particularly when they're on the nesting beach and it's hotter than what they're used to. So they're pretty unique in their adaptations for temperature. All sea turtles, but the leatherbacks in particular, have a very unique method of removing salt from their body. So obviously they're ingesting water as they're taking in prey, and that's salt water. All sea turtles have a very large gland right behind their eyeballs. And that's actually designed to process salt out of what they're taking in, and it is excreted in a salty solution that looks like tears. So if you've ever seen a nesting turtle on the beach, a lot of people will say that it appears that they're crying. It's actually just an extremely salty, slimy solution coming out of that salt gland to remove the salt from their bodies. So that's pretty unique. One of my favorite things about these turtles is their esophagus. Now it's very, very rare that you might actually get to see inside a leatherback's mouth. So I wanted to share this fun picture with you. That is the inside of a leatherback's mouth, just for something for your nightmares later on tonight. But there is a reason for this design. Those points are actually called papillae, and they're kind of rigid, and they all face backwards. The primary reason for having these is that leatherbacks feed almost entirely on jellyfish or other gelatinous animals. It's a very slimy diet. So these prongs, or papillae, um, are essentially designed to keep that food moving in the correct direction, so they're not regurgitating it back up, and it's slimy, so it keeps it moving in the right direction. So pretty unique, unique adaptation. As I mentioned before, they're one of the deepest divers with dives over 4,000 feet. Uh, they do actually spend a lot of time at the surface. They're coming up for air every four to 10 minutes or so, but they can stay underwater for several hours. They do spend as much as 30 to 40% of their time at the surface when they're moving around. So I'm just focusing on the Atlantic here, but they do nest in the Pacific and Indian Oceans as well. Uh, but these are some of the major nesting beaches. You can see that Florida is not really a big one, uh, but we do have a pretty significant population. It's actually that northern coast of South America, as well as some Caribbean beaches that have the biggest nesting populations in the western Atlantic. And not too long ago, they discovered one of the largest populations of nesting leatherbacks in Gabon in Africa. So bringing it back to Florida here, our nesting season, as Nicole mentioned, starts on March 1st. It technically runs through October 31st, but that encompasses, encompasses all three species that nest here. Leatherbacks typically wrap up by the end of June or so. Uh, we actually had quite a few nests in February, so they're getting a little early. Leatherbacks nest, or lay about 60 to 80 eggs per nest, and as all species of sea turtle and other reptiles, the sex is determined by the temperature. So the warmer temperatures incubate more females, and the cooler temperatures incubate more males. Usually takes about 60 to 70 days for those leatherback hatchlings to emerge. And hopefully what happens is something like this. Leatherbacks are personally, I think the cutest of the hatchlings. They just, they look just like adults um, in miniature form. So this is actually, this normally happens at night. This happened to be a nest that emerged right after sunrise. So we were lucky enough to be able to get a video of all these hatchlings emerging. Um, it's not unsafe for them at all. It's fine if they, if they do emerge after sunrise. The heat of the day, 
there are some concerns with that. But this one happened to be early in the morning and this was conducted by a permitted nesting surveyor. So what happens after they emerge and make it to the water? Um, with leatherbacks, we don't know a lot. We don't have much information about what's actually occurring um, between the time they leave the nesting beach as a hatchling and when they return as adults. So that's kind of what's called the lost years and there is some research that's being done on what's going on in those years. So leather, leatherbacks are considered critically endangered. Um, there are quite a few threats. Um, direct take and poaching is a big problem. There are a lot of countries in which both sea turtle meat and eggs is considered a primary food source. Uh, we don't have that much of a problem here in the States. We get occasional poaching, but not very often. But in other countries that aren't as well regulated or where this is a historical source of food, it can be a problem. Chipping is a major threat to these turtles. Um, sorry for the graphic image, I should have warned you, but this is actually one of the uh, leatherbacks that we tagged in the course of our project who was fatally struck by a boat several years back. Um, like I said, they're spending 30 to 40% of their time at the surface, so they are very vulnerable to boat strikes. Habitat loss is another major issue. A lot of you uh, may be familiar with some of the coastal issues we have in Florida and around the world. In fact, a recent study um, estimated that the world might lose half of its beaches by 2100. So beach uh, loss is a huge problem since this is a crucial life cycle point for them for nesting. Fisheries interactions is by far, I would say the number one threat to um, leatherback populations. Almost 60,000 leatherbacks are killed each year in commercial long lines. That's the picture on the bottom right where miles of line are set with thousands of hooks risking entanglement or ingestion of the bait. Um, overall, this is a big problem, not just for sea turtles, but marine mammals, sharks, um, other fish as well. It's estimated that right now, um, our global fishing fleet is currently two and a half times what our ocean can sustain. Um, the US does have a lot of restrictions in place, but that really only applies to about 2% of the entire global longline fishing industry. So this is a big problem. Um, I always wanna point out that this is a big problem specifically in the Pacific Ocean, where the population of leatherbacks has declined there by more than 95% in the 1980s to the point where they have very few individuals left. Um, bycatch is another problem. That bottom left image there is typical of a shrimp trial net. So these are drugged along the bottom or through the water column intended to catch shrimp, um, small fish, things like that. Unfortunately, they're non-discriminatory, so anything in their path is going to get caught up. And if it is an air-breathing animal like a sea turtle, they're gonna get caught in those nets and drown. So this is one of the biggest threats. However, despite all of these horrible things I just mentioned, uh, the news in Florida has actually been pretty good. This is a graph of the total number of nests in the state of Florida since 1989. You can see we've had a pretty good increase in the number of turtles. Um, they really did not nest in the state of Florida prior to about the 1950s and 60s. So this has been good news for them. The issue was we knew that they were here and that their numbers were kind of increasing, but we knew nothing about the population. As I mentioned, it was kind of a new population. We didn't have a lot of history. So we didn't know how many turtles this was. You know, how often were they coming back? Where did they come from? What's the survival rate? Um, so there are a lot of questions that we wanted to answer. So we decided that one of the best ways to answer these questions was to do a long-term hands-on project. So get out there on the beach and actually um, start identifying some of these turtles and learning what we could about them. So back in 2000, a group of researchers from a number of organizations got together and actually designed that project where they were gonna get out on one of the main nesting beaches and do this hands-on research. So essentially what we are doing is driving up and down one of the main nesting beaches all night long looking for nesting their backs. Every time one was encountered, they got a variety of identifiers. So we used flipper tags, which is in this picture here. They're just metal tags like you would see on a cattle ear. We also use microchips, which are the same things we're putting in dogs and cats now that just require a quick, a quick scan for an ID. And then we just took basic measurements, a tissue sample for genetic analysis, and documented any injuries that they might have. So this project was done in northern Palm Beach County uh, for about, I guess it was about a 12 mile stretch of beach. And we did summarize the first 11 years of research in a paper. Um, from that research, we had tagged a total of 466 individuals. 
which was huge at the time because when the project started, state wildlife biologists thought that there were probably less than 100 nesting individuals in the state. So to have identified over 400 was really big news. We also found that their survival rate was pretty good, about 90%. We were seeing these individuals return every few years to nest again. There was about 100 females per year that we were seeing. And like I said, they were coming back every approximately two to three nests, two to three years to nest and laying about two to four nests per year. So one interesting thing was within that 11 year study period, 72 of the females that we observed were also seen outside of our study area. And this was either um, people happen across them while on the nesting beach. We have some morning surveyors that would find them in the morning. There was another tagging program taking place at the University of Central Florida. So 72 different times they observed some of our tagged females nesting outside of our study area. Um, 33 times that was within the same season. And one time it was actually as far as 463 kilometers. We had a turtle that we tagged in Juno Beach that was observed nesting the same season in Georgia. So obviously these turtles are not coming back to the same exact beach to nest. They're really used in the entire state of Florida as their nesting beach. So we started to expand and figure out what additional techniques can we use to help answer some of these questions that we didn't really know. Um, satellite tracking was a big one. We didn't know where they were going once they left the nesting beach, so we did quite a bit of satellite tracking. These are two examples of some of the long-term tracks with a project that we did with NOAA. Um, so these turtles ended up off the eastern coast of the U.S. and even as far, the one on the left there is as far as Nova Scotia. So this is an animation, it's a, just a minute or so long, of some of the turtles that we tracked with NOAA in the early 2000s. And some of these are long-term, some of them are short-term. You can see in just a second here, after they're done for the nesting season, they really vary in the paths that they're taking. Uh, one of our turtles headed straight east out into the middle of the Atlantic. A lot of them tend to follow the same path up along the eastern coast of the U.S., and they vary in how far north they're going. Some of them stop off the coast of Georgia or the Carolinas, and as I mentioned, some make it as far as Canada. We also get the chance to look at dive behavior. Um, when they're in the nesting area, obviously our deepest depths here aren't too much, but when they're out in the open ocean, like I said, they can dive upwards of 4,000 feet. So we've been able to use tagging to look at some of that behavior, which is really interesting. We've also done a genetic study. Now, obviously the, the graph on your right there, I don't expect you to read it, but what it is is essentially a family tree of some of the leatherbacks that we've studied. Um, we've actually been able to use genetic studies to identify mother-daughter pairs nesting on the beach, as well as full sibling pairs. Um, we're actually in the process right now of working with the state to get a statewide genetics research working group going so that hopefully we can work with all of these groups that have collected leatherback samples to get a better idea of how closely related they are. And also of turtles that were unable to document actually nesting on the beach, we might be able to use a sample from that nest to identify who she was. We've also spent a lot of time looking at boat interactions. Um, I'm gonna talk about this particular picture in just a minute and tell you what happened with this individual. We kind of wanted to know um, after a solid 11 years, after just 13 years of doing work on that stretch of beach, what else can we do? As I mentioned, uh, we noticed that through satellite tracking data, these turtles were not always nesting just on that little 12, 12 miles of beach that we were tagging on. So their site fidelity or where they're picking to nest is quite poor. Um, as I mentioned, they're nesting all over the state. So when we were seeing, you know, only two to four nests per individual, it's very, very likely it was much higher than that, but they were nesting outside of our area. So we were missing them. And the issue with that is if we think each individual is only laying two to four nests, which is actually laying 10, we're overestimating the population. That can be problematic when we're looking at overall status. So in 2014, we formed Florida Leatherbacks Inc. and we moved to Martin County, which happened to have the densest leatherback nesting in the state. The goal was to kind of increase the sample size, the total number of turtles that we were tagging, um, address some of those site fidelity issues we were seeing, and then get a better estimate of how many in the nests these individuals were laying and catch those northern turtles that we hadn't seen before. So to kind of put it in perspective, we were working in Palm Beach County um, in 2013. There were 253 leatherback nests there. Martin County had 352, which was 40% of the statewide total of leatherback nests, even though they only had 2.7% of the coastline. So this is a really densely nested beach. 
And these two counties combined had almost 70% of the state's entire leather rack mess. So that first year, um, it was kind of a pilot study. We weren't sure how it was gonna go. It was a new beach. So we only did um, a six week study. Their normal nesting period's about three and a half months, but we just wanted to test it out uh, for logistics and see how it went. So we did about half of the county for six weeks on south part of Jupiter Island and the Hope Sound Refuge in St. Lucie Inlet State Park. And it was extremely successful. Um, we had 173 encounters with 101 unique individuals. Um, and so for that short period of time and that short stretch of beach, this was a really important beach to, to be on. Of those 101 turtles, um, 51 were untagged, so they were new to us. But the interesting part was that 50 of them were tagged in that previous study down in Palm Beach County. Um, so that's down from a 65% recapture rate in, PBC, in Palm Beach County. So you can see the more beach we covered, the more turtles we were starting to see. So this was really working. Those 50 turtles, as I mentioned, 49 of them were tagged previously in previous years in Palm Beach County and one of them in Brevard County by the University of Central Florida's tagging program. Five of those had been observed in both counties previously. So they really are wandering like we had previously assumed. So we decided Martin County was kind of the place to be. It was really helping us address a lot of those questions. So we expanded to the full 25 miles or 40 kilometers of Martin County coastline. And we've been doing that since 2015. In those six seasons, we've had 1,458 total encounters with nearly 500 individuals. So we're now working on a data set of over 900 tagged individuals from the previous organization, our organization, and others that are tagging in the area. Um, what's interesting is that last year, only 25% of the turtles that we encountered were untagged. So comparing that, so we used to see an average of about 50% new turtles, now we're only seeing 25 which means we're achieving more of what's called saturation tagging or really getting an ID on each of these individuals. So it's been really um, successful. We love being out there. We've done a lot of satellite tracking. Um, it's one of the more interesting things I think that we've been able to look at. This is kind of messy, but this is four short-term tracks of four individuals that we tagged a couple years ago. But this is essentially what they're doing between nests. They're coming back every nine to 12 days to nest. Um, so it's a pretty quick turnaround when they come back to nest. What they do is when they nest, they head straight offshore, they hit that Florida current and they're riding north for a couple of days. They usually end up off of the Melbourne, Merritt Island area. They usually hang out there for a couple of days and then they start working their way back south and end up nesting somewhere in our area again. We don't really know why they do this. Um, we don't know why they're making that trip up off the Cape area. Um, it's something we'd really like to look into, but most of them seem to do it. So here's an animation of three turtles that we tagged over the course of a season. Um, it's just fun to kind of watch them bounce around. So uh, Kailani was a turtle that we saw eight times. Isla was one we saw 11 times. Vixen, we put her trans around at the end of season. But this was them bouncing around in between nests. And then this is where they headed after the nesting season. So all three of these turtles kind of hugged the east coast of the U.S. And they stuck around that uh, New Jersey area before the batteries on their satellite transmitters finally failed. Just some really fun stuff to watch. So thankfully last year we received a grant from the Sea Turtle Grants Program. So those of you that have that Sea Turtle license plate, the funds from that plate go towards various research organizations who can apply for a grant to get those funds for their work. And we were able to purchase three satellite tags to try and look at some of the earliest nesting leatherbacks, get those out as soon as we could and try and get an idea of um, really how many nests they were actually laying. Um, we just can't get hands on work enough to get these turtles that are nesting down in Miami and then also up in Georgia. We just don't have the resources for that. The satellite data is a way for us to address that and also look at some of those postseason movements as well. Um, if anybody's in the industry, we use wildlife computers tags. I love them. Um, we've had some great success with them and happy to chat with anybody that wants to know more about experience with them. So we deployed these in early to mid-March, uh, as I said, as a goal to try and capture all of their nests and see how many times they were really nesting and where throughout the state they were nesting. Um, if you have ever seen the satellite tra tagging process on hard shell turtles, normally those have to be glued on, epoxied on. It's much easier with leatherbacks because they have that soft shell, we cannot glue anything to them. Um, so we actually drill through that ridge that I was talking about. It's essentially made of the same material as your fingernails, so it doesn't cause any harm um, or pain to the turtle. So it's just two small holes and it's essentially zip tied right to them. Um, it's pretty small, it's you know that big. They really don't even know that it's there. Um, and we send them on their way. 
So really this information is being relayed to us. Um, we could simply watch the data come in through our computer. These are the three turtles that we put um, tags on in March. We actually had histories with each one of these turtles. They were tagged in previous seasons, so that was fun to know. Um, but one thing we wanted to do was actually collect the data. These tags only relay a certain amount of information to the satellites. So we get a glimpse of what they're doing. But if the turtle comes back and you can plug your computer into her, it actually, um, uh, you can offload all of that archive data from the tag and it's much higher accuracy. There's a lot more information there. Um, it's really interesting to look at. So we would attempt to offload these tags as as often as we could so uh, that we could get a little finer scale um, idea of what they were doing. So yes, we are very techy out there. We're plugged in right with our laptop into these turtles. And we do use a system of um, kind of pingers and GPS location. And we're usually able to find them as they're emerging on the nesting beach just using technology. So why are we offloading? As I mentioned, we want to look at fine scale movements. So with the relay data, we can get an idea of what they're doing. But if we offload, this is roughly one hour of information um, that's being shown on the screen. So we're getting a location every five minutes or so, which is very, very high accuracy. And we can watch some of these really interesting movements. So this is a 12 hour period for one turtle off the nesting beach at night. And it was something that we hadn't seen before, but it's really interesting to see the way that she comes into the coast, heads back out, comes into the coast, and she's kind of bouncing along that shoreline throughout the entire night, almost as if she's looking for her nest site. Um, this is something that once we started looking at these fine scale movements, we see most of our turtles do. And it's something we really want to study more to figure out why they're doing this. So really interesting behavior to look at. Um, and as I mentioned, satellite data is the way to go. So it's a lot of numbers in that chart there. But essentially, these three turtles, we would see an average of three to four times. Malone, we saw an average of three to four times each year before. Nevada, we would only see once per season. But using satellite data, we saw Malone 11 times in a single year in Nevada five times. So we're seeing them a lot more once we have the satellite data to relay where they're at. Um, the third turtle that we tagged, unfortunately, her transmitter stopped working just a month after we put it out. Uh, we are not sure exactly what happened, but uh, the night that we were following her along the nesting beach, her transmitter suddenly stopped working. Um, and the following day, there was a report of a leatherback with a boat strike in the intercoastal. She was alive, um, and the boat strike could have caused that transmitter to fall off if it was her, but we never really got confirmation on that one. So these are the first two turtles I mentioned. So this is just fun watching what they do. Like I said, these turtles nested four, five and 11 times. Um, so just watching them move back and forth between that Cape area and then returning to the nesting beach. Uh, one of them did lay her final nest up off of Northeast Florida, I believe in the St. Augustine area. So they're really varying quite widely, um, but it's just fun to look at what they're doing in between each of these nesting events. So essentially what this project told us is that we were correct to kind of ground through our prediction that leatherbacks are nesting far more often than we think. We had previously estimated maybe two to four times, but these transmitters are showing us it's probably closer to five to 10. Uh, which can result in an overestimation of the total population. So we do want to continue this tracking. We're very excited to say that we have at least another four to eight transmitters to put out this year. So we hope that you can follow along with some of that as we get those deployed in the next few weeks. Uh, this is messy, but each one of those black dots is a turtle that is actively transmitting right now. And I wanted to include it because it's amazing the difference in behavior um, in each one of these these individuals. It's not like they're doing the same thing. We see that a lot with loggerheads and green turtles. They often tend to follow the same migratory paths and end up in the same foraging grounds. Leatherbacks, uh, they do their own thing. They kind of just go wherever they want. Uh, they don't always use current systems, so it's really fun to watch. Um, again, it's messy. I'm going to give you our website if you want to check this out in more detail. But these are two turtles we tracked last year with the Sea Turtle Conservancy as part of the Tour to Turtles. Uh, both followed the East Coast for a while, but one of them, the one in the top right, ended up off of Nova Scotia, and then she ended up in the Gulf Stream and kind of followed that a while uh, before she ended up turning south, and she's actually now heading back this way, whereas the one on the bottom left made her way up to almost New Jersey. She stayed there for a while, and then she headed straight offshore, and I'm going to show you a video of that turtle compared with a turtle who was tagged in Canada. There's the Canadian Sea Turtle um, Network up there. They are doing research on in-water uh, foraging animals. So they're doing boat captures and attaching satellite transmitters. 
And this map, the red dot is Hope, the turtle that we tagged here in Florida. And you'll see the green dot pop up in just a second when they deploy the transmitter on a turtle off of Nova Scotia. And these two turtles kind of did their own thing for a while. Uh, they met up along about the coast of New Jersey. And then both of them, interestingly, just headed straight offshore. Now, this is something that we commonly see with those Canadian turtles. And this is a turtle that was known to have been tagged on a nesting beach in Trinidad and a very common track for her. We haven't seen that with one of ours. So to have seen Hope, the turtle in red, kind of meet up with her. They were actually within a few kilometers of each other at one point. Uh, was pretty exciting. Her transmitter is still active. She has made a turn and is kind of heading back this way. So really fun stuff to kind of watch what they're doing now. And we're really getting a lot more information. So I always wrap it up with some of the more interesting things that we see out on the beach. Um, and not too, I don't want to get too sciencey. So these are just some fun stories. Uh, back in 2014, we came across a turtle on the beach that had tags that we didn't recognize. They were a different style and they did, had a different uh, number code on them. We did a little digging and found out that that turtle was actually tagged on a nesting beach in Costa Rica back in 2001 by the Sea Turtle Conservancy. And it was the first time that a leatherback has ever been documented nesting both on a beach in Costa Rica and in Florida. Um, it has happened twice since then. Uh, I believe in 2015 and 16, there were turtles that were seen nesting in Florida that had been tagged in Costa Rica. So we're seeing this interesting shift, which has been fun. As I mentioned, we do share turtles with Canada as well. The Canadian Sea Turtle Network is doing tagging up in water off Nova Scotia. We have found one of their turtles that they tagged up there nesting on the beach in Florida. They have also found three of the turtles that we tagged on nesting beaches in Florida up off their foraging grounds. They do find quite a few turtles up there that were tagged on nesting beaches in Trinidad, uh, French Guiana, Suriname, St. Croix. So they're finding quite a variety up there. It's pretty interesting to talk to them. So this is the photo that I showed you earlier. It's kind of um, an amazing story. This is a turtle that was tagged quite a while ago, 2003. In 2006, she emerged on the nesting beach to nest and she had this uh, boat strike. That is actually, it's hard to tell, but that's the length of her entire shell, um, head to tail. Pretty severe injury. Um, you could actually see into the body cavity. You could see her lungs. These guys just don't do well in rehabilitation settings. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot that we could do, unfortunately. She was nesting, um, so we sent her on her way. Uh, we were not sure that she could survive this injury, though, because it was very extensive. Two years later, in 2008, one of our surveyors called in and said, you know, I've got this turtle, and gave us the tags. And sure enough, it was the same turtle, and she didn't even recognize her because she had nothing more than just the faintest scar of her shell. So they have the ability to heal um, that is it's incredible. Uh, we've seen flipper amputations that these turtles survive. Um, so they have some some superpowers as far as healing goes that we really don't understand yet. As I mentioned before, we were first able to document 11 nests from a single female two years ago. That was the first for us. So this is a very um, prolific turtle. And last year, if any of you have followed our social media, we had a really exciting opportunity. There was a leatherback nesting in Sanibel Captiva over on the Gulf Coast. They really don't nest on the Gulf Coast. I think there's been three um, ever outside of the Panhandle area, which gets a little bit. Um, but this turtle was seeming to be nesting er, consistently every 10 days or so. So they gave us a call and said, you know, we'd be interesting, interested in putting a transmitter on her since she is nesting quite regularly. We made the trip over and we were able to find her and get a satellite tag put out on her. Um, we were able to observe her nesting, I believe, six times total um, with what they had observed and what we saw through satellite data. Um, really interesting, she actually crossed through the Florida Keys and made her way up the east coast of Florida, which is the first time a Gulf Coast turtle has been observed doing that. So really interesting and fun stuff. I'm curious to see if they start getting more nesting over there on the Gulf Coast now. Um, just some specs, our largest turtle was five foot eight and that, uh, inches, and that's only shell length. That does not include head or tail. The smallest was four foot three. Uh, the most encounters we've ever had with one turtle was 28, and that's over a span of, I believe, 2001 to 2013. Uh, so we saw her quite a bit. The longest gap in encounters was 14 years. So this is a turtle we saw in 2001 and not again until 2015. Um, so that was pretty, pretty um, impressive. And the oldest tag that was encountered is 16 years. Usually these metal flipper tags we put on are falling out. Um, but we have had some retain theirs for up to 16 years. 
And then Clover, she's one of our favorites. This is a turtle that our team knows well. Um, she was tagged quite a while ago, 2003, when she came up in 2007. Unfortunately, she had lost one of her back flippers to a shark attack. Um, she seemed to do okay, though. Um, there wasn't a whole lot that, you know we could do, but she did nest just fine. Unfortunately, when she returned two years later, her other rear flipper was missing. Same thing. It was a shark bite. Um, so unfortunately for them, if you know a little bit about sea turtle nesting behavior, they use those rear flippers to dig an egg chamber. So without rear flippers, she wasn't able to dig. Um, I'm going to share this video with you because we got to know Clover quite well, and she was one of our more predictable turtles. We know every 10 days to go out and look for her, and we kind of developed a special relationship where if we caught her in time, we could actually dig that egg chamber for her. So you can see those rear flippers are supposed to be about two to three feet long. Um, hers are just kind of little nubs, and she's not able to dig a hole with them. So our team, when they would come across, she actually, if you notice on her shell, there has a nice shark bite shape out of the right side of the back end of her shell. Um, but our, our team was able to get up behind her. Um, leatherbacks aren't really deterred by what we're doing. We've learned to work around them. Um, they're also some of the least spooky of all the species. They're not as bothered by human presence as some of the other turtles are. Um, but we've learned to work around them. We try and do all of our work while they're actually egg laying um, because that's when they're least affected by any behavior. So this is kind of classic leatherback behavior had she been not missing her flippers. Kind of a long video, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to see a nesting leatherback. So there's a couple minutes of video here and I'm just about done. I don't want to bore you too much, but videos are always fun. <laughs> so this was a single surveyor. So this is Clover digging. They don't recognize that they're missing their flippers. So she's going through what the normal behavior would be, which would be to scoop out a bunch of sand with that rear flipper and throw it to the side. She doesn't have the portion of her flipper that's needed for that scooping behavior, but she's still going through the motions. And you can see all that pink, that white is scar tissue. This was shot through a night vision camera, so that's why it's black and white. But that is all pink scar tissue from the injuries that she sustained. The uh, surveyor had to put the camera down and then magic happened. Um, he was able to get up behind her and dig the proper hole. We've gotten quite accustomed to what those are supposed to look like. So that's a very professionally dug leatherback um, egg chamber. And Clover had no idea that she was there or that he was there. Um, she just kind of went on doing her thing. So this is her during the egg laying process. They're very still, as I said, not too bothered by what's going on. They'll get a chance to see some eggs here. As I mentioned, there are about 60 to 80 eggs in there and they're usually about racquetball sized. And I believe it was about 13 times we were able to successfully dig for Clover and her hatchlings were able to emerge successfully. Um, unfortunately, we don't catch her every time. Um, if we do not, she lays her eggs at the surface and typically they don't survive, but we felt good doing our part for where we could with her. Um, she's still, she is still nesting in the area. The observers at the University of Central Florida saw her a couple years ago. So I don't want to talk too long because I do love answering questions. I also talk very fast because I love sea turtles and I'm so passionate about it. So I'm sorry if I went through all of that too fast, but I would love to spend some time answering any questions that you have. We are an entirely volunteer-based organization managed by two people. We don't take a salary out of this. We just do it because it's our passion. We have a group of volunteers that help us out with this work every summer and a lot of organizations that really help support us in what we're doing. So a huge thank you to everybody. Um, for listening. We really appreciate it and I hope that I'm able to answer any questions you might have. Um, I wanted to include this. Our website is floridaleatherbacks.com. You can find us on all social media and if you want to look more at the tracking data that I showed you and all of our actively tracked animals, go to trackturtles.com and all of our active animals are there. You can see when and where they were tagged and where they have traveled since then. So I appreciate the time and I hope that you guys have some good questions for me. So I'm hopefully going to stop sharing. All right. Excellent. Hopefully everyone can hear us still. All right. So um, thank you, Kelly. That was fantastic. A lot of people are like in awe with the video of Clover. It's just really 
it's cool to see, you know, to see something like that. So um, a lot of people haven't seen something like that. I actually ask people uh, questions throughout the conversation uh, that you're having, uh, you know, if they'd seen some of these animals and they're like, no, some people haven't. And others are like, yeah, I've had an, uh, had an opportunity, but it's super rare. Um, so, so when you uh, were talking about the nest and someone had a question about, how do you know um, if a sea uh, leatherback is nested or if it's a false crawl? They want to know that, and how do you locate each nest to confirm? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Leatherbacks are one of the di most difficult species. Um, they tend to make a huge mess on the beach. They camouflage over a huge area. Some of them keep things neat and tidy, and some of them will wander four or 500 feet down the beach, and they're throwing sand with those massive front flippers the whole way. Um, so really it's a lot of practice and training, um, but the more sand that's thrown around, the more likely that is that it's a nest. The other interesting thing about leatherbacks is they rarely false crawl. Um, loggerheads and green turtles, the false crawl is when a turtle emerges on the nesting beach but actually turns around without nesting. Um, the false crawl rate for loggerheads and green turtles is usually around 50%. For leatherbacks, I would say it's only about 10%. They just don't false crawl that often. Um, probably has to do with their size. You know, once they get up there, they're going to do what they have to do because they don't want to haul that around any more than they have to. Um, and predators aren't as big an issue for an animal that large. Um, but yeah, so you're just looking at the amount of sand that's thrown around and trying to get an idea of um, whether or not it's a nest or false crawl. As far as how do you find the eggs? Good luck. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. We've got morning surveyors that have been doing this for 20 years that have got pretty good at it um, just from looking at so many of them. But for a new surveyor or somebody that's not seen them before, um, it's kind of shot in the dark. A lot of organizations, if they have the space, will just flag off that entire um, moved sand area because it's just too difficult to find the exact location of the eggs. So they play it safe and they flag off the entire area. And are you guys marking every nest that's out there or you do like maybe every few just to so kind of have another good question. So our group doesn't um, personally do the morning surveys. There are separate organizations that go out each morning and actually almost the entire state of Florida is surveyed every day. Um, and it depends on where you're at. So some of these beaches with less dense nesting, they will mark every nest um, beaches like Palm beach and Martin County. They get, too many nests. They wouldn't be able to mark them all. So they pick a subsample of nests to mark that still gives them a good enough idea of how well the population is doing. The beach that we work on, um, on a given night, I might see 300 turtles. If they were to mark all of those nests, there would be absolutely no beach left for anybody to sit on. Um, so no, they're usually marking, they pick a scheme at the start of the year to give them roughly maybe 200 marked nests of each species. So it really just depends on where you're at. Um, if the density is low enough, then yes, people will mark them all. Um, we work with several organizations that go out and do those morning surveys. So we maintain pretty good communication with them. But where we're at, no, they don't mark them all. Okay, so if we happen to be out on the beach and we come across a leatherback nesting, um, what are the do's and don'ts? What is the FWC doing to protect them from uh, beach goers? I'm going to speak um, to all turtles in general on that because basically regardless of what species you come across, the behavior should be the same. Um, you know, we're Floridians. We like our beaches even at night. The beaches are open to the public, but we do have to respect that it's wildlife habitat as well. There is a chance that you might come across a nesting sea turtle. I do have to preface that by saying it is only legal to go out and view nesting turtles if you're going with a permitted agency. Thankfully, we have a lot of those around the state of Florida that you can sign up and go on a turtle walk with. Um, so I highly encourage if you want to see a nesting turtle that you sign up for one of those. They're usually offered in June and July at a lot of facilities around the state. If you happen to be out on the beach on your own and you come across a nesting turtle, the best thing to do is leave them completely alone, um, give them their space, and definitely keep all lights off. Sea turtles are deterred by any kind of lighting on the beach. So this is important not only if, if you're on the beach, but if you live on the beach to try and reduce your lighting because they are disoriented by artificial lighting. Um, like I said, just give them their space. Um, leave them be. If a turtle is in distress, if you find a turtle that maybe is caught up in furniture or, or, furniture, or if you find a hatchling in the middle of the day, then I suggest contacting either Ocean Rescue um, a lot of rehab facilities, there's a Florida Fish and Wildlife training number, pretty much anybody is going to be able to tell you what to do with an animal that you think is in distress. But yes, the do's and don'ts are, 
are pretty straightforward. Just kind of leave them be, let them do their thing. You don't want to approach them. And if you do want to see it properly, definitely sign up for one of those turtle walks. They're a lot of fun. So, all right, that's if you see them on the beach, but what about leatherbacks in the water? Uh, what interactions could divers have with a leatherback? What are your uh, thoughts on that? If you see one in the water, email me. No, I'm just kidding. I've been doing this for 20 years. I have yet to see a leatherback in the water. Um, I'm seeing all these amazing drone videos and whatnot lately. Um, actually, there is a lot of interaction um, with leatherbacks and local divers. I always love seeing the photos. Um, keep your distance. You know, they do, they will show certain behaviors showing they're threatened. If they turn on their side and try and make themselves look bigger, usually that means they're somewhat threatened or alarmed. Um, but if you happen to get any high quality photos or video, we have actually identified a lot of the individuals that we've tagged over the years based on injuries, scars, and sometimes divers can even see tags. You're probably not going to be able to get close enough to a leatherback to read the little tiny number on it. Um, but if you're a photographer and you're willing to share that, um, obviously we would love to see it and see if we're able to identify um, a leatherback based on their markings. Um, like I said, keep your distance, but they're not going to let you get too close if they don't want to. They're going to be a lot faster than you are. So, <laughs> but yeah, it would be, it's a pretty incredible experience to be able to see one in the water. Yeah. And most likely you're going to see them at the surface, uh, probably when you're on the boat, uh, before you're going to see them under the water. Remember, these guys are pelagics. They're not hanging out on the reefs like the loggerheads and the greens do after they're done nesting. So it's not likely you're going to, you know, swim across one. Um, yeah. It's more likely that you are on our surface interval, or I'm sorry, when you're on your safety stop and one swims by. Uh, I recall my interaction. I got one and one only in Palm Beach. Uh, I was able to, I got up from the dive and the captain shouted, Leatherback! And I turned around, I didn't even put my fins on. I just turned around, threw the reg back in and just plopped in and it was right there. And I got my photos and videos real quick and then it was gone. So yeah, they're uh, fast. <laughs> they're fast and they do, they're not, they're not friendly. I mean, it's not, they're not friendly. They're just, they're not interested in you, so. They're not interested in you. <laughs> yes. Um, somebody asked, uh, you know, are they more active in the morning or at night? I think you kind of answered, but um, just to ask the question again. So the majority of nesting occurs at night. Um, our surveys usually take place at nine from 9.30 p.m. to around 4 a.m. They really vary all night long. There's no certain hour where they're more active. You very rarely see them during the day, but of all the species that nest here regularly, leatherbacks are the one that you most often see during the day. Um, we'll get calls from resorts sometime that say, I've got this massive dinosaur on the beach out in front of my resort, what do I do? Um, so we have responded to quite a few calls of leatherbacks nesting during the day, but 99% of activity occurs at night and that goes the same for hens as well. Um, hatchlings usually emerge based on a drop in temperature. So several hours that after that temperature drops, they'll emerge. So hatchling, hatching usually occurs at night. If you're one of those early risers and you like walking the beach at sunrise, you may get lucky enough to see a few uh, kind of stragglers that came out of that nest a little late. That's always fun to see at sunrise. So, But yes, the majority of all sea turtle activity when it comes to nesting occurs at night. Um, another question was, do you guys know how many make it to adulthood? Good question. So, you know, what's funny is that's a question that's been asked a lot. And the standard answer is about one in a thousand, um, from egg to maturity. So not very many. And that's one of the reasons that sea turtles are nesting as frequently as they are. You know, you may have some of these individuals that are laying a thousand nests in a given season. So maybe one of those individuals will reach maturity, but just based on mortality studies and uh, observational things, the estimate is about one in a thousand. Now that being said, I did mention that with the genetics work that we're doing, we have seen some mother daughter pairs and some full sibling pairs nesting on our beach in Florida. So their survival rate is probably a little bit higher than that, but it's something that we're still really trying to touch on with some of the genetic work that we're doing. Very cool. Uh, another question is, uh, you talked a little bit about how you, you pair with other researchers in the, uh, you know, uh, tropical areas, um, but how about like other places in the world? We know that they're, they're in every ocean uh, pretty much. So, um, how much of your guys' research are you guys able to come together and share and also, uh, you know, give each other, you know, the, not just the data, but the, okay, we've got tags, you've got tags. How are you able to share that information? 
So I'll speak just for the Atlantic. There's not um, a lot of crossover between the Atlantic and the Pacific population of leatherbacks, but within the Atlantic Ocean, it's kind of talking about some of those relationships. So we have great relationships with a lot of tagging programs. And for the most part, all of these tagging programs contribute their data to one central database. So if we find something unusual, um, we're pretty readily able to get the information on where that turtle came from. As I mentioned, we work pretty closely with Sea Turtle Conservancy and the Canadian Sea Turtle Network, but the sea turtle community as a whole is a really small community and it's a really tight-knit community. So anytime something weird pops up, you're usually able to find the source of it. Um, and we do have pretty good relationships with uh, some of the leaders of some of those Caribbean nesting projects. So it's just really fun to be involved with. And even within the state of Florida, there are three different groups that are tagging leatherbacks right now. Um, Loggerhead Marine Life Center tags in Palm Beach County. We're doing Martin County. And as I mentioned, the University of Central Florida tags up in Brevard County. So all that overlap that I was talking about, you know, we're constantly communicating with each other. In fact, Loggerhead Marine Life Center texted me yesterday that they found a turtle with tags that they didn't recognize and it happened to be one we tagged two years ago. So it's fun to be able to have that really open line of communication with everybody and kind of share information. That's funny that you said Loggerhead Marine Life Center because they literally just sent an email during your presentation out that they've had eight leatherbacks come up yep since the start of the season, which was on March 1st. So, yep. uh, <laughs> so yes, definitely the, the uh, sea turtles are active. Uh, so if you yeah. guys don't know, uh, the leatherbacks are usually the first ones to show up on the beaches here in Florida. And then after that is your loggerheads and your greens. So, uh, you know, you guys might have an opportunity to get out there, go diving. You might see some sea turtles here soon because when they're not on the beaches, they're in the water because they're, uh, you know, uh, hanging out, waiting to uh, figure out their next nesting beach that they're going to crawl up onto, it sounds like. so. I, I would love to touch on green turtles a little bit since you brought it up. Um, I didn't talk about them at all because I was just focusing on leatherbacks. But um, green turtles have been a really interesting success story in Florida for the last few years. They nest on kind of this uh, annual cycle where they have a high year followed by a low year. And in, in the last 10 years, we have seen an absolute explosion in the number of green turtle nests. Um, so even those low years are now breaking the previous high year records. And so um, they are actually almost equaling in numbers to loggerhead turtles, which used to be the most numerous turtle in Florida. And particularly here in the southeast coast of Florida, we are just seeing these astronomical number of green turtle nests. So those of you who are boaters or in the dive community probably will definitely have a chance to see them this year because they are forecasted to have an absolutely record breaking year this year. The other interesting thing with green turtles is they mate close to shore um, as opposed to offshore. So if you are out on a boat or honestly even walking the beach, you can often see two sea turtle heads just floating at the surface. Um, that's a mating pair of green sea turtles. They can often be seen floating at the surface for hours. So if you're out on your boat, definitely keep an eye out for them. Um, they usually stay pretty coastal, but keep an eye out for them. Yeah, they usually show up starting in maybe mid-May or so. So it's going to be a fun year. It's going to be a busy year. <laughs> Okay, and the question everybody wants to know about, how do you start working with sea turtles? Uh, so you guys, um, you know, a lot of these researchers, they start off because that's uh, what they studied in uh, their college and they got their, um, their master's, they did their paperwork and they did their PhDs. Um, and so if you haven't gone the educational route, but you're trying to maybe work, um, like say nest, helping them with the nesting season, um, some of these organizations uh, do have volunteer uh, people that go out and do the nesting. Um, there's actually some organizations that pay as well. So uh, Kelly, any, any recommendations on how to get people in this industry? <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I grew up landlocked. I grew up in Michigan. I don't know how I ended up directly with sea turtles, but I always loved the ocean. Um, I had to do an internship when I was in college at Michigan State, and my advisor happened to know somebody in the sea turtle field. So I spent a summer doing that, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, you got to work hard. It's not a high-paying industry by any means, but you got to love what you do. So um, definitely, if you're interested, try and get some of those volunteer positions or internships. As you mentioned, there are both volunteer and paid positions available. Um, we are always looking for help if anybody's interested in doing weather rack surveys in Martin County. Um, we're looking for volunteers that can commit to helping out, you know, a night or two a week or even more if you're available. Um, but really just reaching out because there are always groups that are looking for help. Um, there are, I believe there are 11 different permit holders just in Palm Beach County where we are. 
um, and a couple in Martin County and Broward County as well, and they all operate a different capacity. Some of those are government, some are paid, some are volunteers, so there's a lot of opportunities to really get involved. Um, Loggerhead Marine Life Center is a great place to volunteer if you're interested in the health and rehab side of things. They're always looking for volunteers to help out with that, as well as um, Gumbo Limbo Nature Center when they're able to reopen. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, it just takes some dedication, and sometimes you have to pester people a little bit. <laughs> And guys, it's not very glorious. I've been out there with some of these people that uh, dig the nest. You are sweaty and smelly <laughs> after you're done. And, so, and it's very early in the morning a lot of times. So if that sounds like something you want to do, then uh, yeah, pursue it. But uh, <laughs> um, if you guys want more information, obviously uh, Kelly is going to give you guys her contact information or you can contact 4C. I've got a lot of people who are in, are in the sea turtle research industry and uh, I can help you guys as well. If you write to info at force-e.com, I can give you that information. So, all right, before the end of this presentation, I want to go back over because I told you guys that I had a free SSI Sea Turtle Ecology Digital Kit to give away. That's right, everybody. I uh, got everyone's name that registered on our Eventbrite. And I put it all into this random name picker. So let's see. So again, this is the digital kit. So you'll um, get the information. I'll send you an email, and you're going to give me your information. I'll give you that kit. You go through it, and then we'll do either a Zoom call or if you want to do in person, um, and then we'll get you certified as a ecology sea turtle eco diver or not diver uh, person because you don't have to be a diver to take the class. So, all right, Kelly, hold on one second. I'm going to bring in this uh, here. Okay, everybody, and if everyone can see my screen, there it is. There's everybody's name that registered. Woo! Okay, let's pick at random. Da -da 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 the winner is Cindy Lang. Cindy, if you're listening, give us a thumbs up. Give us a smiley face. Jump up and down. Woo -woo. All right, so Cindy, you're our big winner. Awesome. All righty, guys, I know that we have a lot of um, people that probably have a little bit more questions, but we are out of time. Go ahead and write them here, and uh, we'll have Kelly answer you. And if uh, you have any other questions, write us an email. Make sure you're following Florida Leatherbacks, Inc. at uh, their Facebook page. Do you guys also have an Instagram? Yep. And on Instagram, Instagram Twitter, and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And if you see any of these guys, make sure you're posting and tagging them so that they know that you're seeing them as well. All right. My um, email address, if you have any further questions or if you're interested in volunteering, my email address is Kelly, K E L L Y, at FloridaLeatherbacks.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And thank you so much. We love learning about sea turtles. And everybody, have a safe and wonderful weekend. And we'll see you next week for Facebook Live. See ya. Bye, everyone.